Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around the world. Today we're focusing on the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, Indigenous Peoples Impacting International Institutions, looking at the Indigenous Peoples Strategies at the historic 20th session taking place now at the UN headquarters. I'm very fortunate to be joined by two amazing activists. First, Brian Keane, founder of Land is Life, one of the historic NGOs really building a movement make sure Indigenous people's voice is heard at the international arena. He also played a huge role with USAID to develop policy that impacts Indigenous rights around the world, and most recently was the representative to the UN Permanent Forum for North America, but also the rapporteur for three full years, showing the confidence that the world has in his ability to crystallize all those conversations and comments made during the two-week session to the recommendations that can then change the conditions on the ground. And also with Priscilla Kim Ong, a youth participating in her first UN Permanent Forum. And I'd like to welcome you both. Brian, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Joshua, it's nice to be here. Brian, uh, could you maybe share what were some of the highlights of the first week that took place last week? I know one important event was that the first cabinet indigenous member of the United States Secretary of Interior Deb Hallin gave one of the main speeches at the opening of the permanent forum. Could you maybe highlight some of her speeches? And I know Anna Norgum was elected as the chair again for the permanent forum, a, a Sami woman who also focuses on fisher rights. Could you maybe share some of the highlights of both of their speeches that you saw that are really important for indigenous peoples around the world? Sure, well, I think uh, in, to put it into context, um, this is the 20th anniversary of the forum, as you mentioned. Um, and this comes after almost 100 years of indigenous peoples trying to get a voice within the UN. First, it was the uh, League of Nations, you know, with Descahe, the great uh, Iroquois uh, leader who went to Geneva to try to um, get the uh, Onondaga uh, people's right to self determination recognized by the League of Nations. He was not let in and then Indigenous peoples continued over nearly a century to try to get a voice uh, that led to the creation of the UN Working Group on Indigenous Populations in the 70s, um, which led to, you know, the uh, UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the, the, the Permanent Forum, the Export Mechanism. So we've got all these all this infrastructure now within the UN, the indigenous peoples have a voice. It might not be as strong as we would like to see it, but they do have a voice within the UN system. Um, so we go from 98 years ago, the door being closed to indigenous peoples to the opening session of this year's 20th anniversary forum. And we had uh, Secretary Holland speaking and the vice president of Bolivia speaking, both indigenous. So I think it was pretty historic. Um, and I think that, uh, uh, Secretary Holland's speaking, uh, I think her message was pretty clear that, you know, the U.S. is is back. We're concerned with human rights. Uh, the Biden administration uh, is going to take these issues seriously um, and is going to be promoting indigenous people's rights, not just in the United States, but around the world. And we'll do that through foreign policy and foreign assistance. Um, Yes, and uh, so so I, so I think this is a you know a very historic moment, and I think that the forum, although it's uh, different this year because of the COVID um, pandemic, um, they're only meeting two hours per day uh, publicly, um, but I think that uh, it, it provides a good opportunity for the forum members to to do something new with their report. Um, I'm not sure what they're going to do, but as you know, over the first 20 years, 
the forum uh, just generated recommendations and recommendations and recommendations, and there was no, you know, a lot of them don't go, uh, aren't listened to by governments, by UN agencies and things like that. So I think this is a good moment for the forum to sort of reflect on on how they want to write the report and and, and maybe put a little bit more analysis a bit more of the viewpoints of the forum members into the report and less uh, less recommendations because after 20 years a lot of the times they're, they're re repetitive the recommendations we need to focus on seeing how we can get governments to act on the recommendations that have already been made. Really good points. And it's it's one of those aspects. It was historic that on July 28, 2000, resolution 2000 backslash 2022 uh, did create the permanent forum. And it was important because it also, as you pointed out, brought into a whole lot of areas, economic and social development, culture, environment, education, health, and human rights. And as you talked about it, it really is a focus now, I'd say, not only on the ideas, as you said, with all the recommendations, but really focusing more on the implementation. Uh, did you hear anything new from uh, Chair Norgum about how it might move forward or certain uh, areas that she wanted to focus on as well? I know she did talk about missing women and indigenous girls. She brought up a lot of different examples about what's going on. What are some of those highlights you'd like to share? Yeah, so I think that um, you know one thing is that it this um, current COVID crisis that we that we're, we're we're going through the past year has really brought out a lot of the um, inequalities that that uh, still exist for Indigenous peoples. A lot of the you know they they still are are lacking access to health care. Um, they lag behind all other segments of the population in, you know, all of the development indicators. And Anne Norgum uh, uh, highlighted that in her um, opening statement. And she also talked about, you know, the, the theme of this year's forum, which is uh, peace, justice, and strong institutions, the role of Indigenous peoples in implementing Sustainable Development Goal 16. Now, Sustainable Development Goal 16 you know, the goal the, is to promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, to provide access to justice for all, and to build uh, effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. And so she asked the questions, you know, how, how, do, how, how can this be done? How do we guarantee access to justice for all? Um, what do effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions look like? And what kind of recommendations can the forum propose to move us towards realization of, of, of this uh, SDG 16. Um, she also pointed out that the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples really makes clear what Indigenous Peoples' rights are. And you, you've got the individual rights, human rights, like everyone has, and then Indigenous Peoples also have collective rights. And those can be sort of distilled as the right to self-determination, as well as collective uh, ownership of, of lands, territories, resources, and knowledge. Um, and so how do we uh, incorporate those collective rights into the sustainable, sustainable development goals? Um, she also um, talked about how sustainable development goal 16 um, is, is, is key to preventing conflict and solving conflict. So we see conflicts around the world that are mostly based on uh, competition for natural resources. And a lot of the times these natural resources are in indigenous people's territories. Um, so indigenous peoples have a key role to play in building peace, creating peace. Uh, and then as you said, she, she uh, talked about the individual uh, conflict that's happening, and 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 she highlighted the point about missing and murdered Indigenous women, which is a huge problem all around the world. Um, here in the United States and in Canada and Mexico, along the border areas, there's uh, it's a big problem that um, you know the governments really have to deal with. They they formed a trinational 
Trinational Working Group during the Obama administration. And then that kind of um, wasn't so supported by the last administration. And now that President Biden is uh, in office and uh, now that Secretary Holland is the uh, in Interior Department, they have uh, picked up the ball again on this issue. And uh, Secretary Harland recently created a, um, a special unit within the Department of Interior to investigate uh, th these issues and try to find out what's going on and, and, and find solutions. Uh, so I think those are um, uh, kind of what she highlighted as, as these problems and then link the problems to, uh, you know, they don't just happen in a vacuum uh, that indigenous, that as, as we see governments like in the Philippines and, and other places as they criminalize indigenous peoples, um, they, they, they enact new legislation, terrorism legislation in order to uh, uh, delegitimize what indigenous people are doing to protect their lands and resources. Hand in hand with that, we see increases in violence, increased killings. And sometimes, and Ane pointed this out in her statement, sometimes it's done by uh, military, sometimes it's done by paramilitary, and sometimes it's done by paramilitary and military working together. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, and I guess, I guess the last point I'll mention that she brought up, which is very important, and which was something that Indigenous people have been working on for a long time, is the idea of increased participation of Indigenous peoples in the UN system. Uh, as you know, in 2014 at the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples, uh, governments uh, committed to moving forward a process that would see increased participation of Indigenous peoples in the UN system. So the, the, the idea is how do we, what, what kind of status will Indigenous peoples have? Um, and so that examination or that, that process of, of, of dialogue on this issue kind of came to a halt because of COVID and uh, Anne is urging the president of the General Assembly to uh, pick that ball up again, appoint some um, indigenous people and government representatives to, to move this uh, process forward. And uh -huh. because I think indigenous people have uh, a lot to contribute to the whole UN process. Yeah, I agree. That was definitely the point she echoed about the contribution of indigenous people's wisdom, one, to prevent the harms. But two, she brought up a great point where I agree, where she said, you know, we proved for millennia that we could live in our lands without destroying it. And especially as you're looking at this new 2030 agenda, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, we have so much to offer and you really need to listen. And that, that takes me back. And the other point you brought up as well was, uh, the legislation. And I know we in Hawaii with Amnesty International was able to get a new study uh, adopted at this legislature on missing women and indigenous girls to look at a Hawaii perspective on that. And when you talked about that and you mentioned asking the world to listen, it brings me back to really where Landis Life was formed, you know, there where Marcos Tarena was giving the only speech for indigenous peoples at the Rio Earth Summit in 1992. And he says, I'm here to tell you, but will you listen? And can you maybe share how Land is Life over the 20 years has brought indigenous peoples from Africa to the Amazon to be able to give that message to the world and to provide that wisdom to the world on ways we can go forward together? Sure, as you mentioned, Land is Life was founded in 92. Um, the UN was having their Earth Summit down in Rio, and a group of indigenous leaders decided to, to hold their own Earth Summit uh, in a little valley outside of Rio. So we were able to build a village there, and, and I think about 900 indigenous leaders from around the world showed up. Um, yeah, and Marcos uh, was the only indigenous, they gave him seven minutes to speak to the Earth Summit, and he, you know, he, he made a very strong statement. He said, I didn't come, we're not, we're not here to play indigenous, we're here to fight for life. Um, and so that's what, that, that was the birth of Land is Life, and that's what we've been trying to do now. It'll be 30 years next year. So when the forum was finally created, uh, we thought that this, you know, now that Indigenous peoples have a, uh, a space in the UN, a high-level space, that we really needed to support that. So a lot of effort, as you know, you helped uh, every step of the way. Um, 
was made to make sure that indigenous people could participate and that they could participate effectively. So over the first 20 years of the forum, we have uh, you know, funded, coordinated uh, the participation of hundreds of indigenous people at the permanent forum. And uh, you know, with you uh, for most of those years, in order to make sure that they participate effectively, we would hold three-day trainings uh, just before the forum. Um, and so I think that we've had a, a, a positive impact on the forum. Um, one thing that we were talking about uh, before coming on the air is, uh, you know, the situation back, oh, it must be 15 years ago now in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, reports of atrocities coming out there and against the Mbuti people. Um, and so we had uh, an Mbuti leader uh, that we work with come to the forum and with the then first chair of the forum, Oli Henrik Maga, a Stami man who was the first chair, we were able to um, help him to get a meeting with the UN Security Council who then approved uh, new peacekeeping forces to go to the, to the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. So it didn't solve everything, but I think it was a, um, an important milestone in the forum. And I think that that's something that for me, we need to uh, strengthen this year. So this year I've been um, asking the US government as well as the members of the forum to, uh, make recommendations on the idea of uh, the Security Council making Indigenous peoples a standing agenda item so that every time they meet, they're being updated on the situation of Indigenous peoples around the world, crisis situations, and so that they can take the necessary action to uh, uh, make sure these situations don't, don't get any worse and see if they can contribute to solving some of these conflict situations. Yes, and really the Xenophasi is one example of really putting an indigenous issue on the international agenda because there was no action being taken. The people were being forced to uh, kill their own members or be killed themselves, forced to eat them. And I remember taking him down to Amy Goodman to be on Democracy Now! And the campaign that was really ignited yeah. around the world was, was at the permanent forum, was the entry point but then it organized at the UN up to the Security Council, getting more peace troopers there, peacekeepers there earlier. And then of course, the other side, as you really start to get into is, is policy. And you also had a unique role being with USAID. Could you tell us how you were able to then even shift US government policies to have a positive ripple for indigenous rights around the world? Sure, so I, as you know, in 2013, I got a call out of the blue asking if I would be interested in uh, taking on this new position that was created by Congress, uh, by Senator Patrick Leahy, of advisor for indigenous people's issues for US foreign assistance. So I worked with USAID, State Department, uh, Treasury, because they, make the decisions of, as to how, what the US votes, how the US votes at uh, World Bank and, and, and regional development banks. I consider all that uh, foreign assistance. Um, and with the US missions to the UN um, in Rome, New York and Geneva um, in order to advance indigenous people's issues. So we did a whole lot of things from creating interagency working groups uh, on indigenous people's issues, uh, working, with the interagency on issues of uh, environmental human rights defenders, um, strengthening the US position at the World Bank and at the regional development banks, how the US evaluates um, projects that are gonna be funded by World Bank or any of the regional development banks, how we will vote on those projects and really looking at what their impacts are gonna be on indigenous peoples. Um, strengthening the U.S. position on uh, indigenous peoples at the U.N., so uh, 
you know, while I was there, we supported strengthening of the expert mechanism on, on the rights of indigenous peoples and the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples, the outcome document, which mentions, you know, free prior informed consent in two of the paragraphs, uh, which the US would never kind of touch those words before. And then I think the, what I hope to be the most uh, effective way is I developed a policy for USAID, the policy for promotion of the rights of indig and interests of indigenous peoples. And it's a policy that um, sets the bar at free prior and informed consent for indigenous peoples for all programs and projects that have significant impacts on them. Um, it's tailored to the way that USAID works so that uh, it is, lays out step by step how indigenous peoples should be included in the, in the development of uh, development programs and projects in the implementation, in the evaluation, the monitoring. Um, and so, but, a, you know, a, a policy is only as good as its implementation. So the, the you know, the, the trick now is how do we ensure that the policy is fully implemented? And uh, hopefully with this new administration and hopefully we'll have a really good uh, uh, administrator of USAID, uh, soon it looks like some at the power will be uh the administrator of usaid so i'm hoping that um you know we'll get congress to fund and usaid to commit to full and effective implementation of this policy and then one more thing that in, you know i kind of try to um since i worked on this for so many years i'm still pushing usaid and state department and treasury on, on these issues um I think that uh, it would be good. What I I'm trying to do now is to link up with uh, LGBT organizations, persons with disabilities, um, uh, gender rights organizations, youth organizations, so that we can push the new USAID administrator to change the whole paradigm of how the US supports development so that we go at it from a human rights based approach, whether it's indigenous peoples, LGBT, uh, women, youth, persons with disabilities, we should be making sure that all of our development recognizes and supports their rights. And it, yeah, exactly. No, that's really good. Thanks for taking us on the way that two decades of direct action and diplomacy from the grassroots to the global level and always showing how they're linked and definitely as well the holistic human rights based approach. Uh, we'll now go to Priscilla, who's there at the UN Permanent Forum for her first year ever. Um, fortunately, it's virtual. But Priscilla, what has been some of the highlights so far in the first week and a half for you as a Khmer Krom youth? Thank you, Joshua. Yeah, um, as one of the interns at the Khmer Kampuchea Krom Federation, I was so honored to be able to directly contribute to the work of KKF at the Permanent Forum, as well as give a speech. Um, I think giving the speech was definitely one of the highlights. I was um, a little bit nervous, but once I got talking about the issues of our indigenous Khmer Krom people and giving recommendations to ultimately the whole world about what we can do to help our people. Um, I was thrilled and um, as well as also learning from the other indigenous organizations and the member states about what they're doing to help and how they can improve the work um, that they're doing to help our the indigenous people around the world. Um, I've learned so much because this is not something uh, you get to really learn in school live from actual indigenous peoples around the world. No, that's a great point. And I remember right before the permanent forum started, while we we're getting ready to go there, a youth in the Mekong Delta actually just had copies of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. He had it translated into the indigenous language and he was distributing that. And he was actually uh, arrested, detained, intimidated, interrogated. And you were able to share his story and maybe bring his voice from the Mekong all the way to the global movement. Can you share a little bit about those recommendations and what you spoke about there. Yeah, so that was on the future work, I believe, item seven. And so we really focused on the SDGs as well as um, UN DRIP uh, um, within our recommendations because 
uh, while many Indigenous Peoples organizations and member states are focused on focusing on implementing the SDGs and protecting the rights of our Indigenous peoples and their right to self-determination, our people are just learning about the UN DRIP, which was established over the, or in 2007, so many, many years ago. And so the fact that they're only trying to learn it now and understand it in their client language, and then they're being prevented from doing that, and not only that, but threatened, um, yeah, that was that was our main focus. Um, and it really was painful for us, you know, because we're trying to work at the United Nations. Well, meanwhile, in Vietnam, our people aren't even able to learn about their rights. Very important point. And you also talked about it from the education standpoint, which is excellent because it is true. You actually get to apply the theories from the classes that you're taking and the tests that you take in college and using it not only beyond the grade, but for good. And so it is exciting. I know here in Hawaii, we actually have two courses, a one at University of Hawaii, West Oahu, one at Kamakaku Center for Hawaiian Studies, where students are actually participating in side events. And maybe you could share about the side event that's going to be happening tomorrow during the UNPFII. What will it be covering? Yeah, so we'll be having a side event tomorrow, and KKF will be there to um, likely cover all of the uh, issues that we haven't been able to talk about at the permanent forum um, through interventions due to lack of time and whatnot. So uh, we'll be going back over our human rights violations. That was our main speech that we, or intervention that we hoped to talk about um, as there are many since the pandemic has happened. Um, it's been increasing. And so this, in addition to land rights, um, the issues with Vietnam's law and cybersecurity, um, and a bunch of other things, but we're very excited to talk about it with other people from around the world in Asia. Right, so it'll be a human rights and sustainable development in ASEAN and University of Hawaii and Hawaii Institute of Human Rights is hosting a dozen side events. But Brian, if you could take us out in the final moments, Land is Life also has a couple important side events and it's done great work. Could you share some of those as well? We have a, uh, an event tomorrow on uh, the experience of indigenous peoples and self-determination uh, with regards to their, um, in the Amazon, with regards to how they recover are recovering from COVID. Um, and then we have on Thursday, another side event on the situation um, of security and human rights of indigenous peoples in Asia. Land is Life is, has just launched a, uh, Human Rights Defenders Fund for Indigenous Peoples in Asia, which is modeled on, you know, we have one in Colombia, uh, one in the Arctic, and one in Africa. And so now we've, we've just started this one in Asia. Um, and so we'll be talking about what's going on there, Philippines, Northeast India, other areas. Um, so I think you can find out about all the side events at the UN Permanent Forums website. And uh, we hope to see people there. Thank you so much, Brian. And thank you so much, Priscilla, for giving people an insight into that international institution of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. And I know we'll all continue to organize to make sure that we can realize the right of self-determination. Mahalo Nui, and thank you everyone for joining us today at Cooper Union.